Um, awesome. So uh, let us start the panel for today. Um, well, there are like 115 people uh, today, and I mean, we're expecting 100 more. So that's awesome. Um, uh, morning, all. Welcome to Generalized Panel Discussion Chapter 3, uh, the IB panel. And first of all, I'd like to thank all our uh, mentors uh, for being a part of this uh, uh, discussion today, especially on a Sunday morning. Uh, so in today's panel, we're going to be discussing about what it takes to get into an Ivy League uh, school. Well, most importantly, what it takes to survive it, right? And uh, some tips uh, to improve your application process. Uh, process and, uh, you know, we'll be sharing our experience uh, as to... Uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I'm a moderator. My name is Vishesh. I'm a senior studying at the University of California in Davis. Uh, pursuing economics. Uh, without further ado, I'd request all our panelists to kindly uh, introduce themselves. First, we have Prahlad. Hey, everyone. My name is Prahlad. Um, I graduated from Dartmouth College last June, and um, at Dartmouth, I studied engineering and economics. Since graduation, I've been working as a consultant in the Washington, D.C. area um, for around a year now. And yeah, happy to talk through my application process and my time at Dartmouth and answer any of your questions. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so Jumana will be joining us uh, soon. Uh, Jumana is a sophomore at Cornell University and she's studying chemical engineering and uh, biomolecular engineering. She's an international student from Bangladesh. Uh, and this semester she's been uh, helping her professors uh, take uh, an uh, engineering calculus, teach an engineering calculus course. She's also involved in uh, Cornell's Debate Society, International Students uh, Association, and the Cornell uh, Undergraduate Research Board. Uh, Vasvi. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Vasvi. I'm a sophomore at Columbia University, and I'm studying financial economics and also hoping to do a major in psychology. I'm not very sure what I want to do after college, but I'm really interested in business. And if you have any questions, feel free to speak to me about it over the course of this panel discussion. Oh, thank you, Vasvi. Uh, CM. Hi, everyone. I'm Siam. I recently graduated from Harvard with a degree in applied math, and I had a secondary in CS while I was there. Right now, I'm a strategy consultant at IBM's chief analytics office. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Aranya? Hi, everyone. I'm Aranyo. I was born and I grew up in Kolkata in India, and I'm pursuing a CS and psychology major at Yale. And I have been involved with various extracurricular activities throughout my high school and also at Yale. So if you have any questions about that, how to balance your uh, work and studies, uh, let me know. Uh, thank you. Uh, Arnav? Okay, I think Arnav will be joining us in a bit as well. Uh, he's a sophomore at uh, UPenn and he's from Delhi, India. Um, he's a part of the management and technology, uh, technology program. And he's getting two degrees, uh, one from uh, Wharton School of Business that concentrates on finance and entrepreneurship, and one from the School of Engineering that majors in, uh, and, and he's majoring in computer science. Uh, he's also an, an intern at a private equity firm and uh, wants to do something related to finance uh, after graduation. Uh, Ritwik. Hey, everyone. My name is Ritwik. Um, I'm a senior at Princeton University, and I'm from the Princeton area, originally born and raised. Uh, I'm studying mechanical and aerospace engineering, and on campus I'm involved in many activities such as uh, engineers without borders, uh, prospects and adventures, Princeton Marine Racing Electric, and so on and so forth. I look forward to all you guys' questions. Look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Raghav. Uh, so Raghav unfortunately could not join us today because of some medical emergency. He is uh, pursuing computer science at Brown University and also won the National Child Award for Exceptional Achievement in. 2020. Uh, he's also founded uh, a startup uh, that works closely uh, with people suffering from Alzheimer's. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, move on to our topics of discussion. Uh, and I request everyone to kindly mute themselves and uh, to wait. Just a second. I, I kindly request uh, everyone to please mute themselves and wait towards the end uh, to ask questions from our mentors. And yes, you'll be getting time to ask individual questions uh, from our mentors today. Thank you. 
So, uh, Ritwik, could you please uh, briefly uh, tell us your admission story? What worked for you? What did not work for you? And what was your journey like? Yeah, absolutely. So, ever since a little kid, because I was born and raised in the Princeton area, I kept driving past Princeton University. Uh, a lot of my friends went to Princeton, heard great things about it. So, uh, ever since a young age, I had that aspiration. I want to go to Princeton. Um, then when I actually started the application process, I knew Princeton was my top choice school. So I ended up doing the early application of Princeton and thankfully I ended up getting in. Now, another good thing about getting in early was that, um, that I, the only school I had to apply to was Princeton. So I saved a lot of money on other application fees and uh, I saved a lot of stress and tension senior year uh, because I got in early so I could spend the rest of the time between uh, my acceptance and starting college to just enjoy, relax, and take a little pre-college vacation. Right. Uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say another thing. Um, sort of the philosophy I have with my application was to make sure that I was really highlighting everything I did in high school and um, really catering my application towards Princeton and not making it general um, that could fit to any sort of university. Right. Um, thank you so much, Ritwik. Uh, Prelad. Uh, what part of the application do you think uh, played an important role uh, in your acceptance into Dartmouth? Yeah, so I think I like Ritvik. I took a more generalist approach to my um, application. I just kind of positioned myself to like have a wide range of skill sets um, and not really focus on one specific subject area. Because um, even right now, my work is very interdisciplinary. My two majors are very different from each other. So um, really, really liked having that perspective. And I think that helped for my application. Right, thank you so much. So, so you're basically pursuing uh, two degrees at the same time. And are they both from a, the same school or from a different school? So at Dartmouth, the engineering program is at the Thayer School of Engineering. So it's essentially a subset of Dartmouth College. And then my economics study was um, with the core Dartmouth uh, College. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Prabhat. Um, Vasvi, what was something unique about your application? Uh, what worked for you? And uh, what do you think played an integral part uh, into getting uh, you into your dream school? Um, before I answer, can you just confirm that there's not a lot of background noise of where I'm from? Uh, yeah, that, that's totally fine. You're fine. Yeah. So I think something that was unique about my application was the amount of extracurriculars I had done because I went to a boarding school and I remember in class 11, I was always out of school. I did about 15 debates in 11th grade itself and I participated in a lot of writing competitions. So I think that really shown through my application just how much involvement I had outside the classroom in high school. And I think um, colleges also look for a lot of extracurricular uh, apart from just your you know, academic and your merit in that sense. And so I think that really worked out for me. In fact, that is what motivated me to apply to an Ivy League in the first place because I felt like it really gave me an edge, just being involved in like school and out of school. Right. So, so, so you think that, uh, like, did you uh, write, in your resume, did you put in all the extracurriculars that you had done or did you highlight some specific ones out? Or so I did create a resume basically. So I did. I mostly did debate and creative writing, and I thought that they were very um, sort of relevant to Columbia because we have the core, and uh, Columbia is a lot into reading and writing. And so I specifically highlighted it. In fact, I, I made made sure to really talk about it in my essays because I felt like a lot of students would not have that. And I think just being able to differentiate your application because a lot of applications turn out to be very generic in nature. So just being able to set yourself apart is very important. And I think this helped me do that. Right. Uh, thank you, Vasvi. Uh, Siam, what did not work for you while, uh, you know, applying? Uh, I know it's not a question on there. Uh, we'll be great if you can answer that. Thank you. Uh, what did not work for me? That's a hard question to answer, given that I got in. Uh, right. But I could talk about, I guess, what I learned from the universities that I didn't get into. I think uh, the U.S. definitely treats international students versus domestic students differently, especially when you're someone who needs financial aid. Uh, a lot of universities which, is, which are need blind, meaning that they don't care about finances when you apply, 
are need aware for international students. So if you're someone who needs a lot of financial aid, um, that was the situation I was in. Note that your uh, already small chances of getting in could be slightly reduced at universities which are need aware for international students. Um, I, when I had to express m how much my family could contribute, I did not put like a high amount. I put a very low amount because that was the truth. Uh, however, looking back, I should have put a little bit more so that uh, in the need aware stages of the application, I, I, they would have given me much higher priority. Right. Uh, thank you, Sam. And, and our guests should know that Siam received a 100% uh, scholarship from Harvard University. So I can't imagine him being rejected from universities. But, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we all have been there in that particular situation. Uh, thank you so much, Siam. Uh, Aruna, the next question is for you. Uh, could you please briefly tell us about uh, your admission story? Uh, yeah, so like most international students, I wasn't from like an international school or a school that sends applicants to the US. Like forget admits, our school doesn't even apply to the US in first place. So I think that was kind of where I started from. But then slowly I began picking up extracurriculars outside of school because there was no one at school to help me out. And I began uh, like doing research, connecting it to community service, uh, giving back to farmers from my native village. And that was the major part of my application, which showed that I not only liked science, I wanted to do science for social good. And that kind of worked out at many universities, I think, when I wrote them in my application. And I also made sure to mention in like the additional information section or other parts that how much of it was initiated by me versus, you know, uh, getting support from like the school or like the local bodies. Uh, I think that really showed that uh, I could do things independently and on my own. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Arunai. Uh, moving on, um, Prahlad, why did you choose uh, this university? Uh, were there some other universities that you received acceptance from? Uh, and why Dartmouth, basically? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was choosing between Dartmouth, um, UC Berkeley, and University of Maryland, uh, which is my home college. Uh, I grew up in Maryland. And... I ruled out Berkeley fairly quickly because um, the engineering program at Berkeley is very, like, very technical focused and I knew I wanted to be more of a generalist and um, ruled out University of Maryland for a similar reason that's also a very focused engineering program. And at Dartmouth, I liked how the engineering school is, is really good and really technical, but at the same time, I have opportunities to study other um, sorts of fields and um, got into econ as well. Right. So were there some other universities you got your acceptances from? Uh, like yeah. So Berkeley and Maryland was, and then like the to Michigan, Chapel Hill, right. um, a couple others that I didn't consider as strongly. I see. Um, Vasvi, do you think you made the right decision? So I know it's again, a very open-ended question, uh, but yeah. Um, so it's interesting that you asked me this question because I think it's something that I've been asking myself as well. This is the first time that I've come to campus. And I think just what attracted uh, me to Columbia was just the fact that I was in New York. And I think that just gives you an access to a lot of work experience and internships. And I was also really attracted to the code because I'm someone who, who likes writing and reading and all of that. But it, ultimately, I wanted to do business and finance. And I felt like Columbia does not offer the best major in that sense so i had to do an econ major and that's that's probably something that i'm still uh, you know not very sure about and not extremely happy about but i think that columbia does have a lot of pluses over other colleges and so i think it's just a lot of pros and cons whichever college you make into make it to uh, and i think a lot of research is important especially when you ed because columbia was my ed and i i don't think i was as thoroughly researched about the college that should have been. And I think that's just very important when students are applying. I mean, just apart from the prestige, just really looking at how the college will cater to you is, is pretty important. Right. Uh, thank you, Vasvi. Ritwik, um, so tell us something unique uh, about your university and uh, like, what's the competition like when it comes to classes? Because I know a lot of U US universities have the bell curve 
when it comes to grading for classes and i'm sure at an ivy league institution there it must be like literally like cut throat competition don't quote me there <laughs> absolutely oh uh, that's a great question so answering the first part of the question so the unique about princeton is that princeton is very very focused on their undergraduate education rather than the graduate studies so most of the funding is actually being funneled into the undergraduate program which is really nice uh because most of us would be undergraduates uh most of you guys would be undergraduates when you apply so that's something that's really unique with princeton and to answer your second question about princeton being cutthroat from my personal experience uh i was really relieved when i found that students at princeton aren't cutthroat at all in fact we're supporting each other and this is because the classes are very difficult um it's a lot of foreign material so the only way you can succeed in your homework problems your assignments study together is to group up make up groups and uplift each other and i find that the prince community is really good at doing that no one's ever putting each other down and we're trying to lift each other up uh really relieved to see that and then you also mentioned a bell curve for grading uh in the past this was definitely true princeton was notorious for having grade deflation which means that uh you could get a 90 on a test but if the the percentiles worked out the 90 could be a b plus instead of an a minus right um that was really annoying that was really frustrating and recently the university has done a lot of great work to to mitigate that so now in my experience again uh grade deflation is gone and i think the grading is actually really fair right uh thank you so much uh, rithvik um next uh arun uh what is the importance of standardized testing when it comes to applying to an ivy league school um that's a really relevant question i think especially with universities going test optional i think like uh, there's this thing that most from international students nothing is really optional so whether it's an essay or other parts of an application and i think that applies to even the sat or the act as well because last year i heard a lot of my friends who applied test optional and were really deserving to get in they did not get into their top choices or their ed schools or maybe they got waitlisted which was a majority of them now this might be a small sample size but i think it really helps contextualize your high school because when you're applying from a place like india which is really far away from the us uh in terms of everything academics school uh, teaching uh, having something like at least the sat or act or like not even the ap's or subject tests really helps and as for the english proficiency um, i think what the university say is pretty um, comprehensive that if you come from a high school which has english as a primary language of instruction uh, it is recommended to submit either an ielts or tofl score right so so not to put you on spot but you you currently studying at yale what was your uh, sat or acb score which which test did you choose and why did you choose that particular test so i went with the sat primarily because it was more well known i did not really experiment but mostly because i thought uh, let's just get done with it i gave it like at the end of class 10 and i got a 1460 my first time which i believed was good enough but not maybe above the, the sort of cut off for ib leagues and i attempted it a second time and i got a 1530 because i prepared really well this time and i think as long as you get like above a uh, 1500 or 1510 that's good enough for most schools and after that you should focus on uh, other parts of your application right uh, thank you so much uh, so we have jumana with us uh, now jumana the next question is for you um how important are standardized tests for international students i know that we've already discussed this but what's your take on this question as an international student Yeah so thank you for the question. I think um right now given the circumstances at least for Cornell um they're not looking at standardized tests that strictly but then again it also depends on which college you're applying to. So for the College of Engineering SAT scores have always been a pretty important aspect. So um if you can give your SAT test and if you're able to uh wherever you're living I would highly recommend giving it. Um but is I think it it also gives you a level of confidence because uh sometimes you know your grades may be good or they may be predicted grades so you don't have a good indication of how you're doing so far but like the sat uh can be like a good boost if you if you're able to give it but then again like I said I think this year Cornell is test optional um and unless you're really applying to the college of engineering uh for the other colleges they they don't take it uh as strictly or seriously as uh the college of engineering right uh, thank you so much jamana uh cm so as uh 
Jumana just mentioned that uh, you know even though it's test optional, she recommends uh, students taking the SAT or the ACT uh, if possible. Uh, what is your take on APs? How important are APs uh, while applying to I the IVs? If I have to be very honest about it, I personally think that APs aren't that important. If you're someone coming from an international background, um, I think the admission officers will take into consideration that you are coming from an international background. And if APs aren't widely available in your area, they're going to judge you by the data points that you provide them. Um, maybe your academic results, maybe the standardized tests you took, such as SAT. Um, so I, I really don't think, like, I did not have APs. I came from the National Curriculum of Bangladesh. I know a lot of international students uh, who did not give any APs and still got in. Um, I, I don't think anything could, you know, like, a small component can really make or break. I know people who got in with subject tests without it. I know people who got in with AP without it. I know people who got in with the Harvard supplementary essay and without it. So it, it really depends on your entire profile and one component shouldn't be able to knock you out unless it's like really bad. Like if you submit something and it's really bad, then it can knock you out. But the absence of it may not be enough to knock you out. Uh, and, and thank you so much, Sian, for bringing that out. Uh, so I'd really like to address this to our guests, that every single situation is different. Every single student's application is different. So there's no one single answer to a question. It totally depends. There's a lot of gray area there. So that's why we highly recommend you hiring counselors, because they understand how to move through that gray area to get into your dream institutions. Uh, next question is for Vasfi. Uh, what are your views on the importance of extracurricular activities? Uh, I know you spoke a, a lot about uh, doing debating uh, uh, at a high school level. So uh, what is your take on the importance of extracurricular activities? How many should you have? Should you focus on one particular one or should you, uh, you know, just do five or ten different types of activities? Right. So uh, I, I think extracurriculars, at least in my personal opinion, I feel that they are more important than your academics because your academics are somewhat like a gateway into getting in. It's like it's more of a cutoff and a requirement that you're meeting because I feel like especially for people who have an Indian board, there are so many other people who get the same marks. And so that is not really a good way to be able to differentiate yourself and extracurriculars I think are extremely important um, just participating in school and having leadership positions in school is very important and I think it conveys a sense of sort of commitment throughout the years because you need to be doing something right in your junior years to be able to make it to a leadership position in your senior years and I think colleges can see that as opposed to like just doing well in your 10th and 12th boards um, and apart from just um, um, you know, debating or like any sort of extracurriculars, whether these are sports or, um, you know, whether you write, whether you um, do public speaking in school, I think it's very important to also do some kind of research because most universities in the US are research oriented or getting an internship. So anything that conveys your commitment outside of school, because in school, there are always people directing us about the kind of things to do. There is so much facilitation, which only trying to go out of your way to find someone to mentor you in sort of a work experience situation or one where you're doing active research. I think that really sort of shines through and really speaks about your passion for a particular subject. So, so you advise our guests to basically uh, follow your passion and follow their passions and basically do activities revolving around those. Yeah, and these don't have to be related to the major that you're applying for. And I think uh, just answering a question that you previously asked, just taking one or two activities and sticking with them continuously, I think really helps you grow in that field. And also when you come to college, there's a huge club culture, there are a lot of student organizations. So just having past experience in high school really goes a long way to help you in university as well. And when you're getting hired for jobs or internships, I think club involvement and student organization involvement is something that they really look at in the US. Right, uh, thank you, Vasvi. Uh, so Aruna, I know you're an international student as well. Uh, did you only apply to the US or did you apply to other countries as well? And what would you suggest our guests? Should they have a backup plan within the US 
or outside of the US? Uh, so I think it really depends on your situation, like what kind of citizenship you have, if you need financial aid. So personally, I was an Indian citizen who also needed a lot of financial aid. So I did have some backups back in India and also uh, in Singapore because it's really close. So you can fly uh, back and forth like really on a, uh, it will be very cheap. And apart from that, I only applied to the US and Canada. Uh, Canada I only did three universities, which I heard were really good for the uh, areas I was interested in. Uh, they don't really offer financial aid, but there are a few huge scholarships, merit-based scholarships available. And as for the US, I applied to a lot of universities, including the IVs, um, other top universities, as well as a couple of safeties. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, Ritwik. Could you please uh, talk about your experience uh, while writing your college application uh, to universities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was a very uh, arduous process. And the way I approached it was I wrote a bunch of bunch of different essays, a lot of different drafts. And, um, and then I really tried to get a lot of opinions on it. So I, I gave it to as many friends, families, counselors that I could have. Uh, to check it, see how they liked it. And then from there, I filtered out the good ones, I filtered out the bad ones. And then I final, and then I sorted it down to one final draft that I like the story of. And then that final draft, I iterated on, I iterated. And then when I thought I was done, I iterated on it again. Um, just so it was perfect, just so it was really uh, emotionally invoking. It invoked a lot of strong emotions in the reader, which I think is what an essay should do. Um, so it was a really iterative process. And I got a lot of friends and family to, to read it, got a lot of other opinions on it as well. All right. So, so if I'm not wrong, Ritwik, uh, you moved from the Bay to uh, East Coast to your university for university, right? Uh, no, I was just I was on the East Coast for my entire life. So okay, right. So, so you're not an international student, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Okay. So same question for Jumana, actually. Uh, uh, how, like I, I I know that there's a not much difference between uh, writing for international like international students and for domestic students. But Jamana, what was uh, your experience while writing out your college applications at university? Yeah, so I think I'm going to sort of reiterate what uh, Ridvik said. So like I had many different drafts uh, when I wrote my essays. Um, so what I would do is first I would like any ideas that seemed interesting or that, you know, I could write an essay around. I would like note those down. Sometimes they they were feasible and it would turn into an essay, but sometimes it was just random thoughts. And I think that helped me because um, in the US at least, there are two different essays that you need to write. One is um, a personal statement and one is like a college specific essay. So for example, if you're applying to engineering at Cornell, you need to write related to engineering, something around that. But your personal statement can be anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be academic based. So. The good thing about that is um, if you have any sort of topic that you feel personally connected to, you can write about it. So that's what I kind of did. And then um, after I had written a couple of different essays, I gave it to my friends, family, asked them to check it, revise it. Um, and one thing that was important is that you should be careful when you give it to your friends and family. You don't want them to edit the whole thing because then your voice is lost. And you need to show your voice in the essay. And college admission officers are really good at picking that out. So if you're going to edit, maybe take their advice, but try implementing it in your style, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, I guess. Yeah, and that's actually very helpful because uh, a lot of students get their essays outsourced. And it's, it's very easy to tell the difference between a 17-year-old writing and someone who's actually a professional writer. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Jamana. Uh, I have, uh, so I'll take a time out, please. I have 196 messages uh, in my private chat. I'd really request people to wait towards the end of the panel to address uh, our mentors uh, individually for these questions. Or you can just write, if it's an open-ended question, just write it for everyone so that someone from our team uh, can answer it for you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, moving on, um, Pralat, could you share some tips uh, which applicants should keep in mind while uh, writing their essays, or writing their own college essays? Yeah, um, kind of echoing what Ritwik was talking about. I think the iterative process is, is really necessary for these essays. Just <clears throat> start as early as possible so you have as much time as you can to get a bunch of people to review your essay and give you feedback. And don't get too tied down to one idea or one draft. I feel like that's generally a common like bad practice with writing that people will do. 
um, just be flexible and be willing to change things, especially in the early stages, um, so that you can do more refinement later on. So, so uh, you know, Anna, I'm putting you on spot here, but how many edits did you have uh, for your common app essay? Like, how many edits did you make, or like, did you like how many people did you get it reviewed from your common app essay? It's hard to give a number of edits since, well, one, because it's been so long and two, because I, I probably had too many to count. Um, and in terms of the number of people, I think um, at least five or six, uh, including my peers and friends. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Pralat. Uh, Sian, could you please tell us an interesting part of your essay? And if you want, you can also read out a paragraph uh, or a sm small excerpt from that. Uh, thank you so much. My... Uh common application is essay is actually available on youtube uh so i can put the link in the chat um that'd be very helpful thank you uh yeah but it, it's hard for me to i guess say what what was unique about it if you if you watch the essay because i i made my one of my friends animate it for putting it on youtube note that the original that essay was just words um, uh, it's hard to say what stood out. I think, um, all the, all the person who spoke before me, I will reiterate, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll like basically echo what they said. It is important. It is really important to make sure you get it checked. It is important to sit down every other day and edit it based on your needs. And also it is important to make sure that you do not take too much of everyone's feedback such that you lose your own voice. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Sian. Uh, Vasvi, the next question is for you. Uh, what is the difference between a vice specific essay, a university specific essay, like basically a university specific essay and the common app essay? What should uh, our guests keep in mind? So uh, the Common App essay is actually about you. Um, and uh, so one thing, a kind of um, like an analogy that would be helpful would be if you're sitting in a room full of people and uh, your Common App essay just falls off and lands in the middle of the room and it does not have your name on it and someone picks it and reads it up, um, they should come and give that essay to you because they should just know that it's about you. So that essay should be a very authentic sort of reflection on yourself, but it should really tie well to your experiences and like to your productive experiences, I'd say. So it has to be a mix of emotion as well as sort of your passion should come through in that. Whereas the why um, university specific essay should really be about what makes you sort of what attracts you to that particular university, what you, how you see yourself uh, performing there, how that university is really going to help you grow. So I think um, that, I think they're widely different from each other in that sense. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Vasfi. Uh, Jumana, how about you? Like, uh, what, is the, what are the different types of college-specific essays uh, that are required uh, to be written by an international student? Uh, while applying to an Ivy University? Um, so I can only speak for Cornell University because it's the only Ivy League I actually applied to. Um, but like, I don't think the requirements are different from US citizens in terms of the essays. I think both have to write uh, engineering, like for the College of Engineering or any other college you apply to in Cornell, um, you have to write an essay for that college, and you have a general personal statement. So I think Cornell is a little different from the other Ivy Leagues um, in the sense that you have to declare your college before you um, decide to you know, enter the university. So you can choose any major within that college. So because of this, your essay that you write for the college, so let's say if it is for the College of Engineering, it should be very specific to your engineering experiences to your interest in engineering. Um, but your personal statement, like everyone else uh, before me has said, it's, it's personal. You can write about anything. Um, you could write about some of your qualities. So that's what I did. I wrote about a quality that I have and why that quality makes me unique. Um, so yeah, I think right. that's, um, that's it. Thank you so much, Amana. 
Uh, moving on, uh, scholarships and financial aid. I know it's a big topic. Uh, CM, uh, what uh, helped you bag a scholarship at Harvard? What helped me bag a scholarship? It is to be noted that these Ivy League universities uh, generally give most of the time meet demonstrated aid, right? Uh, demonstrated need of money. Um, you can call it financial aid. You can call it scholarship. You can call it whatever you want. But if you get into an Ivy League university and you have a demonstrated need, chances are they're going to meet most of it, if not all. Um, what helped me get it? I think it's your entire profile. Um, a lot of people would say that, okay, this is more important than the other. I'm, I, don't, I don't agree with it. I feel everyone... Uh, all of the components are equally important. Um, I, I had good academic um, results. I had good extracurricular activities, recommendation letters, standardized exam scores. And all of that combined together allows you to have this overall impressive profile that may just work for uh, admissions. And then what happens is that if you are someone who needs a lot of money. For instance, Harvard's policies, if your family earns less than $60,000 per year, they're going to meet um, all of your financial need. So for me, that was the case. And Harvard gave me 100% financial aid or a scholarship, and it covered everything I could imagine. It was like worth almost $77,000 per year and it covered everything. And I think that is generally the case for most IVs. I also got into Princeton and the offer I got from Princeton was like similarly generous. It was something along the lines of like $70,000 per year. Uh, so yeah, if, if you have a follow-up, I could answer it. But that was it. Right. So, so did you apply for uh, need-based financial aid through the CSS profile or uh, did you just uh, kind of just submit your application uh, and put a tick on the common app which, which asked you, are you looking for scholarships? Uh, no, I, 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 it's hard to remember because I did it in 16, but I do remember submitting the CSS application to all of the universities I applied to. And I applied to only four or five universities. Um, because I had a, I got into a good university in Bangladesh and I was like, I will just aim for the top. And if it doesn't happen, I will stay in Bangladesh, which looking back is a mistake. All the applicants applying always have backups, always, um, uh, apply to safety universities. If you don't have an idea which universities to apply to ask your counselors, right? Like, okay, can you give me a good list of universities? Uh, I, I applied I, I do, did send the CSS profile to all the universities I applied to. I did indicate that I need financial aid in all of my applications. That indication doesn't matter to certain universities like Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, but it does minor, like it does slightly matter to other universities like Dartmouth, Cornell, or Columbia if you are an international student. Right. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, CM. Uh, next, uh, next question is for uh, Arunai. Uh, can you uh, explain, like, uh, talk about uh, uh, exemplary achievement that aided you into, uh, you know, uh, getting your admission into your dream school along uh, with the scholarship that you received from that? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Uh, before answering this, I would like to briefly go back to the previous question for a while. So I think uh, sometimes life does get busy and you need to sit down for a while to write essays. So what really helped me was watching TED Talks on the topics I wanted to write about. So you can easily go into the transcript on YouTube and you can read through and get some general idea on what people who are in the field think about the topics. Because TED Talks are usually really well scripted. And that's a good way to start brainstorming as well. Um, as for achievements, uh, I represented India twice at ICEF, which is an international research fair that is held in the US what was held virtually last two years. And I converted this research project into a community service initiative in my local village 
which also received the Diana Award this year and a couple of other community service recognitions in the past few years. I think that kind of helped me stand out from the crowd. Apart from this, I also had some tangential uh, extracurriculars, like I wrote for an online website, I did some mental health advocacy work, but primarily it was research and community service intertwined. Um, as for scholarships and financial aid, uh, I did receive really good packages, uh, not only from Yale, but also other need-aware schools like Rice, uh, University of Richmond, and a uh, couple of others. I also received merit scholarships at the Canadian universities and Vanderbilt. So I think uh, if you look at it from the point of an admissions officer, would he allocate 80% of aid to one student or would he break that up into three pieces and give it to like three students out of which say two would attend? So I think that is the way colleges might look at it because most of them have limited funds. In which case, if you really bump up your application, you show them that you are really uh, someone who would add to the student community and you're really uh, someone who would enroll there, I think your chances definitely go higher at receiving 100% uh, of your need. Right. So, so just a follow-up question. Did you apply to all schools uh, for the need-based financial aid? Or did you also apply for merit-based scholarships to some institutions? And since all our guests are high school students today, could you please break down uh, and tell the difference between uh, a need-based financial aid and a need-blind merit-based scholarship? Yes, of course. So uh, there are two kinds of financial support that you can get from US universities. One is need-based. So they won't look at your marks or your extracurriculars, nothing at all. They would only look at your family's income, assets, the finances and they would decide how much you can afford and the rest they would pay on behalf of you as a grant. There's also merit-based scholarships which can range from say half tuition to full tuition to a full ride where they cover different parts of your uh, finances just simply based on your say GPA, SAT score or your overall extracurricular and academic profile. So for the Ivy Leagues they mostly have need-based financial aid they don't have merit scholarships. I know like Harvard, Yale, Princeton don't have merit scholarships, but the other IVs do have some few merit scholarships. But for other US universities, they have a mix of both. So you can get like a combination package which meets your entire need. Uh, some universities that come to mind which have really good merit scholarships and all international students should definitely consider include Vanderbilt. They have a full tuition. Uh, there's uh, a lot of liberal arts colleges have scholarships, say University of Richmond has a full ride, uh, which like two, three Indians get every year. Uh, USC uh, also has a half tuition and a full tuition. So definitely like search, search merit-based scholarships for internationals while making your list. And I think that will help because the competition for need-based is definitely much more. Right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Ritwik, does your university... Uh usually give us scholarships to internationals. If yes, uh, what type of scholarships? Oh, uh, yeah. Princeton always gives a lot of good scholarships, as everyone else discussed, um, and that's open to international students as well. Uh, I'm not really sure on the types of scholarships because I'm not an international student myself, uh, but I'm sure one of the other panelists can uh, talk a little bit more. I'm sure it'll be the same across uh, most of the universities. Uh, right. And, and okay, so I think my next question goes to uh, Jumana then. Uh, Jumana, uh, did you apply for need-based scholarships to uh, universities? I did. I applied actually a combination. I applied for merit-based and I applied for need-based. So for Cornell, they only offer need-based. However, Cornell is need-aware, which means that your ability to pay uh, for the college gets factored into your admissions. So um, like, I would recommend everyone who's applying... To, oh. There's one more thing. Um, if you are coming from India, they do have a special full ride, um, I believe, financial aid for Indian students called the Tata Scholarship or something like that. Sorry, I don't know much because I'm not an Indian student, but um, anyone else who knows about the Tata Scholarship, um, should you should check out Cornell for that. Um, one thing I will tell students is that if financial aid is a big factor, then definitely try, like if your scores and if, if your entire profile is good. Um, you should try apply to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. Something I, which I really regret, I didn't do, um, because those are more likely to meet your aid without 
factoring in your admission capability, which can sometimes hurt because you may actually have a chance at a university, but your financial situation does not allow you to get in. Um, so yeah, that's that's for financial aid. Honestly, just complete the application properly. The CSS profile can take a long time, but like if you don't complete it properly, then sometimes just for silly reasons, you may not get the financial aid. Um, the other thing is for merit-based scholarships, um, I got, I applied to a mid-tier university, I think. I got uh, half tuition for it. Um, the goal is that for many merit-based scholarships, in addition to essay, sorry, in addition to GPA and SAT scores, they require essays. So like you'll probably have to write a couple of essays, why you want the scholarship, why you're a good fit for, for the program or the scholar scholarship that they they're giving out so yeah just keep an eye out for that right uh, thank you so much jamana and and yes there are a lot of uh, other organizations that extend uh, help to international students uh, by covering their college fees so you should definitely uh, look out for that uh, and also as jamana mentioned uh, the csc profile takes a lot of time and the deadline is way ahead of your actual common app deadline so in case you haven't started it already I think it's a good time to start now. Uh, Vasu, the next question. Hello, is to you. hello, hello, sir. Pardon, pardon, pardon me, please. Uh, uh, I'm I'm sorry. I really can't. Uh, like I've asked everyone to uh, kindly wait till the end to ask uh, questions to our panelists. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the patience. Uh, Vasu, our next question is for you. Uh, did you apply uh, for scholarships? Uh, could you tell us about how your application uh, went with regards to that? Um, so Columbia does not offer merit-based scholarships to international students, and so I didn't apply for that. Um, I also uh, initially wanted to apply for financial aid, but I realized I should not because uh, Columbia typically does not, uh, I mean, they, they are need aware, right? But they do not uh, really offer financial aid to international students. And uh, in my year, at least, only eight students from India got through to Columbia and none of them got any sort of financial aid. And so that, that leads me to believe that um, Columbia mainly offers financial aid to domestic students, international students. International students is where it gets the bulk of its funding from. So for anybody who's at least looking to apply to Columbia, I would suggest not applying to financial, not applying for financial aid. And in case you need it, um, you should probably look at Harvard, Princeton, and all of the colleges that are need blind. Uh, right. Thank you so much, Vasvi. And also, uh, Princeton is, uh, I just checked, Princeton is not need blind. Uh, it's completely need based. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, I, I hope that was helpful. Uh, okay. And this is, uh, the major part of, of our, uh, presentation today. Um, so I keep this open-ended for whoever wants to answer, uh, which I hope our mentor wants to answer. What's the impact of COVID-19 on your education so far? And, and you can just take the question head on, whoever wants to answer. I can take it. Um, mm -hmm. It was extremely inconvenient. I absolutely hated it. Uh, I, my senior, entirety of my senior year switched to online where we were doing all of the classes completely online. It is to be noted that they were generous enough to let the international students um, stay on campus, whoever applied. So all of the international students, like my other senior friends, they were on campus, which allowed, ha allowed us to have some sort of social life but it wasn't that great a lot of the beauty of a college education or just like these universities come from the social events come from what you could do together every clubs would have amazing social events where they buy a they go to a great restaurant or a great venue every now and then houses would have formals and those are the most memorable um, i guess moments of my college life and in the senior year, you do most of that, right? At the senior year, everyone kind of becomes um, very, uh, you only live once mindset and everyone tries to have as much as fun as they possibly can because most of them already finished their grad school applications or already have jobs, right? Uh, their GPAs don't matter as much anymore. Uh, so they have a lot of fun and we did not get to do uh, like a lot of it. So, so, so COVID um, 
was like it it stopped us from going to social events online classes are not the same it it takes a huge toll on mental health it 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 increases stress and anxiety um so there was that and finally it wasn't fun to see the great socioeconomic divide that um that was more apparent to once covid started because a lot of people who comes from better socioeconomic backgrounds could go back to their homes and they would have their own rooms and they would have great wifi and they would cope with it meanwhile a lot of my classmates you know had to share a room with their parents um they did not have great wifi they struggled every now and then so it, overall it was like a uh, it was a pretty terrible situation and i and i hope um no other student in the future of the university have to face anything similar right i actually completely agree with you because uh, i flew back for my senior year back uh, to india and i took a gap year uh, because of this uh, so it was it was a big huge hassle simply because uh, you get a five year visa uh in the us and i don't have my post opt because of this uh, but yeah uh, how about you prelad uh what was uh, you know like it, it like taking classes in the pandemic how were teachers uh you know what was university life like for you so i graduated in 2020 um covid hit in march so the way dartmouth works is a little different from other schools we have a trimester system so um instead of having two semesters in a year we have three trimesters and covid hit right between our winter trimester and our spring trimester so the timing the, that was for for what happened it was decent timing in that um i could i ended one set of classes and started another set of classes completely online and um i was fortunate in that my family is in the us so i could stay home and dartmouth did not grade um classes for that semester so uh that a uh, like lack of grades on top of being home and not having the opportunity to do anything fun gave me um the time to take really hard classes and like learn things that I really wanted to learn so i guess that's kind of the silver lining that i could focus more on the learning and not having to worry about grades and study things that were interesting and challenging to me instead of trying to just take classes from my major or classes that would boost my gpa right and and i i'm assuming your uh, the farewell ceremony was online not offline unfortunately because of the pandemic yeah yeah that's right it was a, it was a youtube live stream i just kind of sat home and watched it right yeah thank you thank you so much uh, i think uh, i also found a very good question on chat uh, uh, vasvi due to the pandemic my extracurriculars uh, have kind of been low lately how do i improve and uh, find internships and competitions I think I can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. I'm gonna go for it. So, Anna, if you want to go for it, you can. Okay. All right. Um. Yeah. So, actually, I was in the same boat as this because I spent my whole freshman year online from home. Um. So I was like trying to find something to do in the summer, and I would recommend trying to do virtual internships. It's not the best, but um. you know you, you can still get like i mean as long as you don't mention virtual on your resume or on your linkedin profile no one knows and it's still a valid internship in- experience i think and so like for those of you who are struggling with ecas or you know in general just do virtual ones um and there are lots of professional development seminars right now related to like you know uh major exploration options or like if you're unsure about what you want to do attend those um and if you really have nothing to do there is always um i'm forgetting the name edx right so you can take some courses um so like now is a good time to learn that coding course that you always wanted to or you know just take a random class for fun i took an english class just cuz i wanted to do something different other than engineering all the time so like you know there are things to do like you can't say there aren't things to do because nowadays everything's online so like try to make the best of it unfortunately i mean it's going to improve but it'll take time so yeah right uh, jumana could you please drop the uh, link for the website that you mentioned for our students and yes there are a lot of certifications that students can still do uh, and they're completely online uh, basvi uh, what's your take on this 
So I would just like to um, push back a little on, uh, you know, sort of replacing internships with online courses because I feel like colleges not really give you a lot of credit for doing those because anybody can do an online course. Uh, having said that, I think it's great to do one. But I think that cannot really be a replacement for an internship. And while I struggled as well uh, due to the online format getting an internship, I also feel like um, it's become more leveled in terms of being able to secure one. Because I am from uh, Kanpur, which is like a remote city in India. And I was there uh, throughout the summer. And most internships that are available in India are probably in Mumbai or in Bangalore. And just because everything was online, I, I got an internship um, in a startup that was running in Bangalore and I think I wouldn't have been able to get that um, if, if nothing was online this year. And so I think just using that to your advantage is really important. I think LinkedIn has really, really picked up this year. And uh, while it does uh, take a bit of time to really get an internship that you want on LinkedIn, I think if you're consistent with it, I think if you reach out to people, you network well. Um, you can really find an opportunity that is useful. Having said that, there are a lot of internships that come out to be scams and are not very helpful, I would say. So just be very careful, but also be very consistent. And I think it's harder this year to get one, but um, it's also that you have a better chance to get one. Also, just utilizing your personal network is extremely important. Even when you come to college, you realize that networking is a very, very important sphere. So while you're at home, take advantage of your parents' network, your cousins, your friends, your family, and you'll probably get an internship or some sort of an experience that will be relevant to applying to universities. Uh, right. And, and people who come from family business backgrounds or have friends who have family businesses, it's always uh, best to reach out with them as well uh, to look for internships because after all, a college admissions counselor would not know if it's your own business house that you've done internship with or uh, an external agency. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Vasfi. Uh, next question is for Ritwik. Uh, again, uh, I found this on chat. What weighs more, uh, the standardized test scores or the extracurricular activities? I know it's a very open-ended question, but we be great if you could answer. Yeah, so um, my direct answer would be extracurricular activities. I feel like standardized test scores and GPA are more of a necessary but not sufficient condition, which means that it's sort of expected for you to have good test scores, have a good GPA. A real, what will really distinguish yourself from the applicant pool is your extracurriculars, what you really did on your own volition and how you set yourself apart from the crowd. And I feel like the opportunity to do that uh, lies in extracurriculars. So being entrepreneurial in what you do, um, the impact you have. You can't really do that with uh, standardized tests or GPM. Right, right. Uh, does anyone uh, have anything else to say uh, on this? Does anyone take this differently than Ritwik? Or, or do you all agree? Okay, I guess I, I, guess uh, I think, uh, yeah, so I had something else to add, I guess, because often we think like extracurriculars or academics are like completely separate things, which is not the case. Because while your scores and GPAs is academics, if you do stuff like science fairs or if you do online courses, I know Stanford has uh, really good online courses, uh, which you can get scholarships for as well. Those also count as co curriculars and they have both an academic as well as a social community component. So those are really good options. Right. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I kind of uh, agree and disagree uh, from the both of you. I feel that uh, academics are super important. And given this uh, pandemic, we've seen like a passive uh, transition from people, you know, uh, accepting a standardized test to actually accepting high school grades more. So it's always nice to uh, have a good GPA all throughout high school. And along with that, let's say if you are uh, missing out on a particular subject, there's always SAP subject tests which I think got discontinued. So there's APs, uh, SAT mains, uh, and TOEFLs to kind of bolster and show uh, that academic side. So like, let's say if you've been like an 85 or a, a 88 student and you're still aiming for an IV, it's totally possible as long as you have a good SAT score. Because, you know, like I, I'm, I'm assuming uh, uh, not every school grades in a particular manner and it's actually difficult. Imagine an admissions counselor sitting at Cornell uh, viewing students from all across India from 50 different boards from 500 different schools, it is a tough decision. So having these standardized tests kind of place you, places you at a bar with other students inter, uh, across internationally. So it's easier for them to kind of place you in a particular bracket. So definitely if it's possible for you, if there's a center nearby, just go and take on the SAP. I, I'm assuming there was one 
day before yesterday, and there's another one uh, happening in September. Um, uh, next question uh, for Pralad. Uh, what is the university doing for new applicants with regards to uh, COVID-19? Uh, you, know, you know, one of the examples is making standardized uh, tests optional, but along with that, what about the safety measures and the precautions? Yeah, so you're right, Dartmouth um, is standardized test optional at this point, as are a bunch of other schools. Uh, classes are still going on in person. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm off campus, so it's hard for me to really give a direct perspective, but people are still hanging out and doing stuff in person. Um, but the town of Hanover, where Dartmouth is located, does have a mask mandate. Um, and I believe students have the option to take virtual classes or be remote if they choose to do so. Um, but um, again, since I'm not on campus, it's hard for me to give a more immediate perspective. Right. Is someone uh, actually on campus, any one of you, who would like to take this question head on? I'm on campus right now. And actually, this for this term, um, for us, like anyone who's not on campus uh, can't do classes anymore with Cornell. They're going to have to defer a year. So they've actually made it mandatory where everyone has to be on campus right now, regardless of what the situation is in your country. So um, Cornell is really good about giving vaccines to students who haven't had them. So like personally, I haven't been able to complete my vaccination. So I'm going to get that done. But um, yeah, mask mandate is everywhere, um, except for when we walk outdoors. So um, when we're like walking outdoors, Cornell is like, you can remove your mask because it's a shared open air. So it's okay. But like, um, like in, inside the dorms or like, when you're walking in the hallways during classes, you have to have the masks on. And they do testing like twice a week uh, for unvaccinated students. And then they have testing like once a week for vaccinated students. And all the lectures and professors are happening in person. So nothing is online at the moment, but like uh, it could change anytime. Even our, I think our exams are scheduled to take in person. Um, so yeah, Cornell was actually operating online even in fall 2020 but sorry it was operating in person and online in fall 2020 but like this term they have started going fully in person so yeah right um, and i think it's a similar pattern at most universities in the us it's pretty safe because uh, they've made like a mask mandate in class as well uh, along with like uh, mandatory testing and like isolation of people wherever there's like a covid case L literally like the entire building gets uh, isolated and locked down if there's like a covid case in there um, uh, moving on to the next question, uh, Ritwik, uh, I just found it on chat, which one of these two, IELTS or TOEFL, do you, you recommend, uh, should we take while, uh, you know, applying to, uh, get, uh, an Ivy League institution? So basically uh, IELTS or TOEFL and what's the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So I think both of them are pretty similar, but I don't think I'm the best panelist to talk about that. Uh, so I might defer to another panelist, uh, with, with more knowledge and expertise on the subject. How about Vasvi? Do you want to take this question? Um, in my opinion, and what I was told is that um, they're actually pretty similar um, and don't have much of a difference. And I'm also not an expert on this because I think they're virtually the same. Um, it's just that the way they grade is slightly different, but in, I don't think either is harder or easier. So. But, I mean, uh, I completely agree with Vasvi, and uh, I'd actually like to mention the history of IELTS and TOEFL. So IELTS actually got famous in India because of IDP and, and gets a lot of funding. IDP gets a lot of funding to promote uh, IELTS in India. Essentially, they both are English proficiency tests and have the exact number of, like, not the number of questions on the format, but the ex exact kind of questions. So uh, you don't need any kind of, uh, like, academic guidance to take that test. Just take a few practice test papers, choose whichever one you're more comfortable with and whichever one is available right next to you and uh, just go for it. Uh, and this is the last slide for our presentation. Um, uh, I would like to jump in a bit, I guess, on the yeah. IELTS thing. Because yeah. I saw a question in the chat about CBSE school and I was from a CBSE school which most schools in India are have English uh, as the primary la language of instruction. But I, but I think like the you still need to give the test because not only it makes you much more confident, but there are some unis which will ask you. So like uh, just take it uh, once and uh, because that would really help you with some unis and also during the visa process. 
and I personally took the IELTS because it was cheaper but I also think the format is a bit more easier than the TOEFL uh, and you all also get grades like 8.5, 8.75, 9 and on the TOEFL it's like till 120 so I think the grading is also a bit more uh, lenient on the IELTS but you could also consider the Duolingo English test which is really popular nowadays with COVID and with that you get more flexibility because you can take the test twice in a month on the same application fee and I believe it's like online it's people have told me it's easier right uh, thank you so much uh, and yeah we all have different opinions just uh, choose the one that you feel most comfortable with and which you have closely available uh, you know and whichever one is the best for you so it totally depends but everything is accepted so it, it's not like one IV is preferring a particular exam uh, so you can just take anyone that that you find uh, best for yourself uh, now in the end I'd like all of you to share a unique experience you've had at your university so far and uh, I'll take the lead and then people can just go ahead on uh, so uh, Davis is actually called a bike city and it was quite intriguing uh, you know in my first week of classes when I actually saw my professors uh, imagine a 65 year old professor biking to class so it's quite funny to see that and uh, basically there are no cars allowed on campus everyone just bikes or walks so that's something unique about my university and uh, anyone of you can go go ahead and just like you know it'll be great if you could just like uh, mention uh, unique experiences or unique points about your university uh, for our guest today thank you so much yeah, so I can take uh, take the next one. So at Princeton, and Princeton really values uh, service work, so giving back to the community, uh, doing community service work like that. So one of the clubs I'm a part of is called Engineers Without Borders. And what we do is we find communities in need and help them with an engineering project they might need. So I took charge on a project where there's a community where they couldn't get clean drinking water, and we installed a plumbing and water distribution system that would take water from a stream or rainwater uh, filter it and then distribute it to their houses. So it was a really great project. It was a lot of fun. And what I really liked was the unity between what we were learning in class as well as service work. So being able to give back to the community. And a unique experience, like uh, something that really touched my heart from this experience, was um, the entire members of the community, they all got together and they took an aerial shot where they're standing and said, Thank you, Princeton, uh, like from the top. And they sent that photo to us. And we never asked them to do that. Um, that was just like their way of saying thank you, extending their appreciation. Um, and that was a really heartfelt moment for me because uh, it just shows how great uh, education is. And especially when you combine it with service, um, how powerful and how much of an impact we all can really have. Um, uh, thank you so much, Ritwik. Uh, someone else? Uh, so I just moved on to campus like five days ago. I did an orientation program and I think one unique experience I've had which might be true for other universities as well is meeting people from so many countries. Like I was moving out of my dorm and I saw a person just pulling up their luggage like to the fifth floor. We just talked. He's from Palestine. Then as I just walked a few meters away, you know, there were people from Hong Kong, like all the countries you could imagine and just seeing them living in this small space. Um, so I'm in Saybrook College and Yale has like 14 different residential colleges where you live, uh, you eat, you do everything except from like studying and seeing people from some different, such different backgrounds in one small space living together is just so exciting, um, it really gets you going and like thinking about the world in general. Uh, right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Vasvi, Pralad, anyone of you? Um, so I could go. So uh, Columbia has something called the core curriculum. And uh, basically, um, in your first year, everyone takes this class called Literature Humanities. And it's a discussion based class. So it's a pretty small class with 20 people. And we have uh, a range of different books that we discuss across class. And I think that was one of the class classes that really helped me grow. We really bonded together as a class because it happened across two semesters. So we were together for a year and uh, my professor was great. So I think that that was one sort of experience that I had never had before in school because the kind of discussions they had and the kind of input that everyone had uh, given to the class really helped me grow as a person. And I think the quality of discussions we have had at Columbia are unprecedented, um, at least in my experience. And I think that's just really what distinguishes this university in my mind. Right. Uh, thank you, Vasri. Uh, Prilad, do you want to take this question as well? 
Sure. Um, so Dartmouth is actually in a very remote part of the country. Uh, it's in the middle of a very large forest and a very large mountain range. So um, outside of campus for fun, a lot of people do outdoors activities. And there's a tradition every year where the incoming freshman class goes on a five day trip experience, which is basically camping and hiking and doing other outdoor stuff out, outside or outdoor stuff like with a, um, a Dartmouth student mentor. Um, so I really enjoyed my experience doing that as a freshman. And then I also led a trip where I was essentially in charge of like the hiking experience for a group of five people, five incoming freshmen, which was really amazing. And outside of that, I love just going out with my friends and getting a cabin or going for a day hike or something like that. Right. So, so we, we all can see that, uh, you know, like uh, a lot of our guests actually asked this question to me uh, before this panel, that what's the racism level kind of in the US? And I honestly, from the experiences, I think it's pretty much clear that the entire university community is very welcoming towards internationals, towards domestic students. And you just kind of blend in with everyone. And, it, and just, just as I don't know, a message, uh, you know, spoke about uh it's quite intriguing to have like people from 50 different cultures from different countries blend in together and, you know, come up with something beautiful. Let's say about, uh, talk about the project that Ritwik mentioned where, uh, they kind of built something, uh, you know, so that I'm, I'm sure there were people from, uh, different backgrounds and different cultures as well. So, uh, it's a very welcoming place and, uh, you should all look forward to applying, uh, to, to the U S uh, now I know I, I have a very interesting question in chat. Someone is asking, what is an ideal score to get into an Ivy League university? Uh, just to take this head on, I think anything above a 14, 80 or above is a good score. I mean, even a 1500 or above is a good score. Uh, but it totally depends from applic applicants to applicants. Uh, and yeah, would anyone else like to uh, differ from this or uh, take this question differently? Or do you all agree? Um, I could chime in. So I would say that I would agree. And a lot of times when you're looking at the SAT range for different universities, I think we need to realize that as international students, uh, universities are way more picky while selecting us. And so uh, really the upper end of that range should apply to us. So we should really focus on getting that score um, sort of at the upper range and uh, the initial scores really don't um, I, I don't think I don't I don't think they really give us ground to get in. So I think that is something we need to be mindful of when really selecting colleges. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Vasvi. Um, and uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being uh, in the panel today. Before uh, everyone leaves, uh, like I had promised, that this is going to be an open-ended uh, session towards the end. So I kindly request everyone to just write like one, two, three, four, or like me, and uh, we'll go in an orderly fashion, and you can address uh, the entire panel or you can ask questions directly to university specific mentors. Unfortunately, uh, uh, our Howard mentor and uh, I think our, uh, uh, and Jumana had to leave because, uh, from Cornell had to leave because they had some prior commitments, but I'm sure all of us can answer and facilitate uh, for, the, for them as well. Uh, first we have uh, Siddhant. And, and let's say if you're not comfortable uh, asking questions directly uh, by unmuting yourself, we can just ask your questions in chat and I'll read them out to the panelists. Uh, so Siddhant, go for it. Vanshnoor uh, is the next person. Vanshnoor. Uh, so, uh, hello, sir. Uh, so, uh, I, am, I am audible to you. Uh, yes, you are. And in case you have an open-ended question for uh, just everyone, uh, you don't need to, uh, uh, you know, address it to someone specifically. But if you, have, if you have a question for someone specifically, you can just address them directly. No, sir. I have just a common question. Like during this COVID, I read a lot of researches and all, and a bit of international courses and all from universities like Stanford and all. And uh, specifically, I read it in different 41 fields, and for that, I got a bit of uh, means awards and all. Will this thing? really help me to get into some good college like my researchers and all and some valuable fields like COVID and all. Will this be helping me to get into some good schools like Harvard and all? Um, does anyone want to take this question head on? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so I think for research and like um, 
doing university courses you have to be really specific i heard you mention like you did 40 research projects i don't know if that's the right amount but while you mention this in your application or generally while say in your interviews or on your resume just mention like the top two or three and it's even better if they are more recent like in a junior or senior year because that would really show that you put in a lot of effort towards one particular thing um especially during a trying time like covid where i don't think it's really feasible to do like multiple projects so choose the projects that you really love that you really worked on and kind of align with your intended majors and display them in the best way possible uh, does that answer your question vanshni uh, yes sir yes sir thank you sir Awesome, thank you. So I have a few uh, direct messages before I move on to the next uh, participant. Um, so this question is again open ended. Um, how could we get to make up for uh, that one less year of education if I do my bachelor's in UK since my colleges in US consider the three year degree inferior to four year degree ones? So basically, I'm assuming that someone is asking: uh, uh, Is it fine if someone does a bachelor's in the UK and then applies for masters? Uh, in the US again, this is a, an undergraduate discussion. But does anyone have any idea about this? Okay, no worries. I can take this head on again. Uh, so even if you uh, have done your undergrad uh, graduate degree in, in the UK, you can definitely there are a lot of agencies which actually allow you to rate your degrees, and uh, you know they basically rate them and make them four years. So you so you can definitely uh, apply with your three year uh, UK degree uh, as well. uh next question is uh from prisha and she's asking please give me an idea about community work so i really address uh, i really ask you to uh, kind of uh, debrief this question on chat if you want uh and i i can come back to this later next we have adi diman who has a question um basically my question was going to be addressed to cm but since it's not here i'll, I'll be asked I'll be addressing Rasvi and Aranya. Um, since they are from India, I I want to know about like, did you get? Uh, I think Aranya got his financial aid, and but I also want to know about that when they moved to America, how uh, what financial challenges did uh, they got hit by, and what were the living expenses and the difficulties, and did they go for a part time job to uh, have these things you know balanced financially for themselves. i got part of your question who went for a financial job like the people not on aid i'm sorry can you please come again uh you mentioned like some people had financial challenges so they might have taken on part time jobs who specifically did you mention uh no i i'm addressing to both you and vasvi so anyone okay can okay okay mm -hmm. um so for me uh i'm um like yale met more than my need so i'm basically like um i don't have any financial challenges of that sort but yale does have a lot of student jobs you can go to a website you can apply the minimum wage is also really good and i know it's easy to get a job because i'm an international student living on campus on financial aid so they usually prioritize these kind of students for the uh, jobs so uh, i haven't got a job yet but i'm applying to a few and i think other than that um there's also a safety net you can apply to to buy like emergency things which can be medical which can be like winter clothing and i have heard that it's uh, it's a great great resource uh, that yel has thank you very much yeah if you want me to uh, sort of add to that i did not apply to finance i did not apply for financial aid and uh, so in order to like brave some of the financial challenges uh, what i did was apply for uh, to be a resident advisor um so uh, this is basically an on campus employment and they compensate me by uh, making my housing free so um i did that and uh, it sort of worked out well for me so you can look for uh, employments on campus um as an international student since you're in, on an f1 visa you won't really get of campus employment that easily so on uh, campus employment is really the best way to go thank you very much that pretty much answers my question right thank you vasvi uh, so next question is by arka and uh, she is addressing to ritwik i plan to pursue uh, aerospace major uh, iot and rob uh, robotics 
as an undergraduate uh, as an undergrad i may apply to u colorado uh, georgia tech and caltech i also plan on sitting uh, for the tu delf ex- uh, entrance exam but i don't have great scores in 11th and 12th uh, and consequently in 12th but that was mainly due to my ma- due to a major in- uh, injury uh, what extracurriculars and sat so i'll just copy and paste this question for you rithik uh, again so it's easy for you to read it what extracurriculars and uh, sat ielts can help co- uh, me compensate this uh, could you please answer so i'll just copy and paste this question by arka oh bye bye absolutely so uh, the first thing i'll say is that uh, as we discussed before like an sat can't compensate for something else that's not really how it works as we discussed uh, earlier in this panel what i will say though is because you said that the reason uh, your grades might have taken a hit uh was because of an injury if you express that clearly in your application and you know I can help you with however you want to express that um they will sort of be a little bit more considerate about uh about that hit so make sure you express the reason why it happened express how there was no other option and then we'll also say is in MAE there's a lot of opportunities to sort of overcome hurdles and the universities and uh, the application offices are really impressed when people do that So for example corona is a great uh, opportunity for most of you guys to be like everything was shut down but I still persevered and found opportunities or did something um just because that's how passionate I am. So if you do something like that with aerospace um or robotics it'll be really helpful. Uh thank you Rithvik uh Arka does this answer your question? Um uh, uh next we have a question from Kartike. Kartike you can just unmute yourself and go for it. I think I think he's left. Uh, Shri Purna is next. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so actually, I wanted to ask that uh, means uh, to get into uh, that good colleges. Um, one thing is that um, maximum of the applicants who go to uh, you know Harvard and all they have a. Uh, olympiad background so uh, c- uh, means uh, leaving all these olympiads and all uh, what can uh, a, a, a student do in uh, his uh, class 11 or 12 uh, to stand out from the crowd uh, if uh, um, the s- brother said that uh, he is one community service god uh, uh, this one uh, dyna award and uh, i researched all this then uh, i saw that uh, it really makes it uh, impressive and some uh, Uh, some uh, means uh, researchers and um, some courses done by in adex uh, really helps a lot so if if someone could please uh, say me about all this or is anyone thank you this question sir yeah so initially even i was thinking of like pursuing olympiads because uh, like he said uh, many students from india uh, also like have some sort of olympiad background but then i didn't qualify like the national level so what i instead did was iris national fair so it's similar to olympiads but it is an international research fair where 20 students from india selected uh, to and they fund your travel to the us you stay there for 10 days you participate uh, in the science fair so i'll leave that link for that in the chat i think the deadline for this year is october 31st so you could check that out that's really helpful but other than that i think just be out on the watch on like linkedin and other platforms if you visit profiles of students in your batch or like your seniors who are in ivs or other universities you will see their achievements you'll see the summer programs or internships they have done and you can often try and um apply to the same programs as well uh, uh thank you uh does that answer your question uh, brother please could you uh, could you please uh, give the link because i joined it late so Uh, so very please get the link thank you yeah thank you uh, next we have aditya aditya murthy uh hi uh, am i audible yeah wonderful so uh, my first question is uh when i do university specific courses like say i do a course from stanford uh as uh, would it get better chances of getting into stanford or no Okay so so who wants to take that question uh Rithvik do you want to take it Yeah absolutely um so I'll just do the analog to to Princeton because I go to Princeton 
Uh, the, the short answer is no, because a, there's a program in my high school where you could take Princeton courses, and I didn't do that, and the people who did didn't get in. So it, uh, what I'm trying to say is that there's no direct uh, you know, link between taking a course at a university and that increasing your chance of getting in that university. What I will say, though, is that if you do take college-level courses and you frame it the right way, you say that I did that to challenge myself, um, I did it to, exp- uh, to demonstrate my passion, then that'll be good. But just keep in mind that taking a college class at a university, it automatically doesn't just defer you to default you to be more impressive in the application. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Awesome. And I, I'd just like to uh, add in a few things. So every single university essentially has uh, multiple uh, colleges and schools. So imagine your laptop screen uh, to be a particular university. Imagine the top left corner to be School of Engineering, the top right corner to be School of Business and uh, so on and so forth. So not every single school at a university offers a course, uh, which is you know uh, closely related to your major. So on and often, even if you've taken a course at a different university, it will definitely aid uh, to, towards your resume, but not towards your admissions, not so much towards your admissions into that particular university. Uh, next, we have uh, Stuti Sharma. Uh, no worries, uh, Stephen. So, uh, Stuti, in case uh, I've missed out people, they can just write me again or just type out your questions and I'll get to that pretty soon. Uh, Stephen, you're next. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the session. Stephen, so my, I have basically two questions. The first question goes on like, I graduated from class 12 last month. So, as according to the US admissions policy, I would be applying as a gap year student. I have done pretty much a great stuff, uh, NGOs and all that. I would be st- like, I have a thing in my mind that I would be studying music with psychology. So integrating uh, my target schools, Harvard and Berkeley, they do offer a dual degree program. So uh, applying as a gap year student, what are the views of the panelists? Like, is that a negative side of the or I am gravitating towards something really good, as if like. In 11th and 12th, I will do much because of uh, some disabilities. Uh, so basically, your question is: uh, Would that gap year play uh, a disadvantage to your entire application process? Yes, if I have done great things in that gap year. So, so in. As lo- so, so I'd like to take that question and, and someone else can jump in as well uh, with answers. As long as you have done something uh, useful in that one year that you've taken that gap year, it does not matter as much because, I mean, I have had people who are 26, 27 and still pursuing their undergraduate degree at my university. So it totally depends on how well you've played your entire gap year and what all you've done. In ca- if, if you've just idled around because uh, it was COVID year, then uh, I don't think that's a strong enough case to get you into a good university. But if you've done a, a lot of activities revolving around your specific major or revolving around the pillars for your specific major, let's say if you want to apply for computer science, then along with coding, teamwork is also another uh, pillar that you could you know, uh, work and, and develop. So uh, you should be good to go. Does that answer your question, Stephen? Yes, sir. Can I ask another question, sir? Yeah, go for it. Uh, but, but you're not audible. Could you please be a little more loud? Uh, I'm audible now. Yeah, this is better. So the next question is around uh, um, research internships. So I've heard uh, so many college YouTube, uh, YouTubers say about like you should email to professors and all that stuff to get into you know, uh, to get into research open opportunities with professors from Harvard Corner and some might have got. So is there any uh, kind of like method or equation that we need to follow step by step in order to get into any research opportunities and the follow-up question is, when is a good time to start with like rigorous SAT preparation is one month, you know, sorry, that's the question. So uh, who wants to take this? Uh, Prilad, would you want to talk about the first part about uh, reaching out to professors uh, for uh, internships under them? Yeah, um, just to clarify the question, are you asking about internships pre-college or in college? Pre-college. Pre-college, okay. Um, it can hurt to reach out to a professor. Just follow good etiquette around that. Send an email. Um, I'd say to express your interest more so than just um, expressing that you want to work for them. Just potentially read up on their research, 
have a personalized reply um, indicating that you know what they work on and have a good reason for engaging with them and potentially phrase it as a conversation. Um, just say you're interested in learning more and have some questions about this field, want to get into this field. Um, and then um, the other thing I'd recommend is it's a numbers game. A lot of these professors are very busy, so they might not get back to you. So just um, reach out to as many people uh, as, as you can. And hopefully something works out from all that. Uh, and the second question, uh, would uh, Aruna want to answer it? Uh, like, what's the ideal time and how much time does it take to prepare uh, for the SATs? I think one month should be enough if you plan it out properly. I personally studied for the last two weeks, but I know the writing and reading section can be a bit difficult for Indian students. The math is usually um, just like browse Khan Academy and you're done. But for the English section, definitely go through Erika Melzer, like especially for the writing because that's where a lot of silly mistakes creep in. But other than that, just plan out like one month or like and do a lot of practice papers, especially in the last one, 1 1.5 weeks and you should be good to go. Right. Uh, thank you. And I think uh, if you're not an academically inclined student, uh, one month is not enough. Uh, for me personally, I took uh, approximately two to 2.5 months. But uh, the key here is constantly practice uh, papers. Don't just look at concepts. The more you practice, the, the higher chances of getting a better score you have. Um, uh, next, uh, does that answer your question, Steven? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Awesome. awesome. Uh, next, we have Gagan. So Gagan had asked the question in chat. I come from an area where extracurricular activities are not much encouraged. So does uh, that cancel out my chances of getting admission? Uh, Vasvi, would you like to read this question? Could you repeat uh, the beginning? So, 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 the, uh, so Gagan is saying that I come from an area where extracurricular activities are not much encouraged. So does that uh, cancel out my chances of getting admission? I would not say it cancels that out. And um, I really want to know like what specifically uh, discourages your participation in extracurriculars. I know a lot of schools are not very um, you know, motivating and don't have a lot of uh, sort of choice uh, about the kind of extracurriculars that you can participate in. But then uh, if you are a motivated person and if you really want to get into an Ivy League university, then you are going to have to give in that much work and uh, there are opportunities available everywhere, nationally, internationally, I'm sure within your city. So the whole point of really participating in extracurriculars is to really go beyond. And uh, then again, network, uh, use LinkedIn. There are so many opportunities that you'll come across on LinkedIn. Um, sign up for every little thing that you see, talk to people. Um, I'm pretty sure there'll be people in your city, in your school, who will have similar aspirations. Um, they'll probably have a few resources that they can share with you. You can share your resources with them. And just building a community around that um, and really looking for resources and really following up. Uh, of course, if you don't have extracurriculars in your school, it can get harder. It'll require more time. But I think that much amount of work is um, worth it at the end. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Vasvi. I hope that answers your question, uh, Gagan. Next, we have Jay. Uh, so Jay had asked, uh, is GRE waived off for fall 2022? Again, this is an undergraduate panel, uh, but uh, I can answer that. So if you're applying this year, yes, a lot of universities uh, have gone test blind for masters as well. But then it again depends from case to case. Uh, what is your GPA in college like uh, and a lot of other necessary factors. So uh, you can always reach out uh, to UNLI on their website and uh, uh, Postgraduate specialists can answer that question better for you. Uh, next, we have uh, Varshika Chauhan, uh, who is who is saying, uh, "What is the process of applying for a need-based scholarship? I mean, a process process in chronic uh, chronological order." Uh, Arana, would you like to take that question? Uh, yeah. So basically, once you're done completing at least the first draft of your essays, because you know you need to submit an application, you, you just can't prepare the financial thing first. Then uh, reach out to your parents, ask them to get your income tax documents, their assets, do those calculations that you'll find on the CSS website. And it's very simple. You only need to tick a box in the college application that you want financial aid that is need based. And then you have to submit the CSS profile uh, and filling out the CSS profile while it takes like three, four days minimum. If you have all the documents ready, if you have done the calculations and the best thing is you don't have to convert it to dollars. You can enter it in INR. 
um, it shouldn't take you much time. And once you're done with that, you just add the colleges you want to send it to. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all. They might sometimes reach out for additional documents, but in most cases, that's just enough. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And specific to UPenn, uh, since I've helped people out, uh, UPenn also has a second uh, document that you have to submit after the CSS profile. So make sure you don't, uh, you know, miswrite things like you don't write, let's say $10,000 in your CSS profile and write $12,000 in your UPenn app, uh, specific uh, profile, because that's going to definitely misfire and uh, be taken against you and you'll get uh, rejected. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Shirja. Okay. She's just like, look up at the acceptance rates. So she's saying, uh, look up at the acceptance rates. I know the acceptance rates are very low, but I think if you're constantly at it and if you're uh, working very hard and uh, just submit a very holistic profile uh, and, and you'll get into your dream university. Um, next, we have a question from Ashwin. Did any of the mentors avail college counseling services during their application? Uh, who wants to answer this? Uh, Vasvi, Arunoy, uh, Prahlad. Ritwik, did any of you take college counseling while applying? Uh, I was strongly considering in my senior year, but the reason why I didn't take it was because I was already a bit busy with other things. But I think it can be really helpful, especially if you're from a background where no one really applies and you know, a school counselor is kind of clueless about how to present your profile or like help you uh, draft those essays. So I do think it can really be a good source of guidance if you need it. I agree. Um, I too used a counseling service mainly for essays, and I think um, it was quite helpful in order to like navigate the whole process because it can be a little daunting uh, just doing all of that on your own. Right. Uh, thank you guys. So actually, I personally went to Unilever for uh, my college guidance, and I was from the first batch, and I had uh, met these uh, a lot of amazing people, and it was, it was very helpful because I could get an inside scoop about universities. Like you know, you can you. Know, imagine what our mentors today are talking about, uh, which is specific to their university. So that was kind of very helpful. Uh, so I would highly recommend people getting a college counselor, uh, unless you think you have like 95% or something. Uh, I think you need it. Uh, next, we have a question from uh, Kushar who's saying how to get into Harvard. Now that's a very vague question and uh, Siam is not here. So I would just make it open-ended how to get into an Ivy League university. Uh, Pralat, would you want to answer this? Yeah. Um, so I think echoing off of what everyone said, having a good test scores and a good grades are kind of the baseline requirements. Every, every applicant will have those. And then beyond that, the way to stand out and um, actually be a viable candidate is to have really good extracurriculars. And that could really take any form, but I think the best advice is to find something you're really passionate about and make an impact in it. Um, I think having a leadership position or just something where you're organizing and managing um, things is particularly important. Uh, a lot of people will join clubs, um, not as many people will lead them. And that's the kind of thing Ivy Leagues look for. And, uh, thank you so much, Pralat. Kushar, I hope that answers your question. We have a lot of chats and I know people are raising their hands as well. It'll be good if you could just write uh, in the chat and I'll get to you in an orderly uh, fashion. Next, we have uh, Apoorv. Uh, who is asking, can I have a go? So, yes, Apu, you can. Hi, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, so, my question is, uh, is on the standardized test scores. So, I have heard people like say that uh, if you're, you have gotten, uh, if you've got a score of under 1400, the AYLE colleges don't even review your application. And I, I myself got 1300 uh, in the only side that I took. And so that that is a bit concerning about me. So if anyone can tell about that. So I personally think you should uh, practice and give the SAP again, because uh, 1300 is not an app score when you're applying to IVs. Uh, but if anyone has a different take on it, you can go for it. Uh, uh, Ritwik, Vaspi, Pralat, anyone? OK, I think uh, everyone agrees uh, to this. Um, so next. Uh, this Stuti was saying, can I ask a question about masters? So no, because this is an undergraduate panel. And if you want to ask specific questions regarding masters, it'll be great that you could just uh, log on to the UNLI uh, website and uh, ask the question to a PG specialist. 
because all of us are undergraduate students. Uh, Siddhant is asking how holistically do admissions officers scrutinize our application? Uh, Prithvik, what do you want to take that? Yeah, so uh, it's short answer is extremely holistically. Um, a very important thing you guys should keep in mind when applying is your entire application. So that includes your extracurriculars, your essays, etc. Should all tell one cohesive story. Um, and this is because the application is holistic. So don't say your focus in one section is uh, you want to like change the world and then another section be like, oh, I want to have high impact and just get money, right? Because that's not holistic. So just make sure your entire application is cohesive um, and the application is definitely reviewed very holistically. Uh, right. Uh, thank you, Ritwik. I hope that answers the question. And, and actually, Stephen has a very nice uh, reply to that. They just want to see you. So yes, the entire application process is revolving around you. So make sure uh, you don't get lost uh, you know, trying to uh, brand the kind of activities you have done. I've seen a lot of people write in the Common App essay, talk more about the MUN than themselves. So uh, please don't do that. Uh, next, we have a question uh, from Dia, which is specific to masters. So I'm going to skip that because uh, we don't have uh, app knowledge about it. You can definitely ask an advisor at Gnirali who specializes in that. Uh, Lavanya, to the panelists, did you apply for ED or EA? And did you get into the university of your choice? Uh, Vaspi, would you want to take that? Um, I applied AD and uh, yeah, I got into the university of my choice. And I think it, it was just really convenient just in terms of not having a stressful um, time around January and December. And I think once you get your results, it, it feels really good and you can uh, sort of really concentrate on your boards then. Um, and just choosing the right ED, as I said, is really important because it's a binding decision and you might later have uh, second thoughts about the college ED too because that closes your options off. So I think just think long and hard about where you're ED. Right. And, and actually, uh, my answer differs because uh, I got rejected. Uh, I applied uh, uh, ED to NYU and I got rejected. But one thing you should keep in mind is keep your other applications ready. Imagine uh, your uh, application results coming out by November end or by early December and suddenly you realize you've been rejected and you have nothing ready. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a very uh, disastrous situation. So have at least some applications and essays written beforehand so that you don't go through that, you know, uh, last minute stress uh, uh, about, about your entire application. Uh, also for undergraduate questions, in case I miss someone out, you can always go and ask our specialist at UNRLI in case I miss her questions. Next, we have a question from uh, Prisha, who's saying, uh, does the social work, what are the social work which I can do for my resume? So I'm assuming uh, you should just look around and spot out whatever there is within your society and community uh, that you can work upon. Uh, and honestly speaking, even if nothing is very small, even if you do a very, uh, let's say a small detailed activity, you can always uh, write it in a very magnified manner in your resume. So it, it does not matter if you have done an international level activity or a very, you know, a very uh, city level activity. What matters is how well you address it on your resume because formatting matters. In case you have you've done an international level activity and you have written a very clumsy paragraph about it on your resume, the college counselor is just going to get irritated and not read it because they have exactly one, 1.5 minutes to review your uh, entire resume. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, next, we have Anuj who is saying to the panelists, Average GPA from 9 to 12 with 1500%, 1500 plus SAT score help us get into Harvard or other Ivy League universities. Uh, who wants to take that question? I don't know. Who do you want to take that question? Uh, I think as long as you have like 90% 90 plus, 90 plus, I know this differs widely from school to school. Like DPS, I know, has a lot of great deflection. So getting 90 plus is like a huge deal. But as long as you like um, in the top 10% of your class, I think you should be good enough. So that might be 95% plus for some schools, 90% plus, but that's a good way to go about it. Top 10%. Right. And honestly, I've uh, also seen people submit their grades and percentile. So let's say if you have an 82 or an 83 and the percentile standing is above a 95, I've seen people submit in, uh, it in that manner as well. So that, that is another option that you can look at. Um, Prisha is asking, uh, I'm not into any of the sports. Does that cancel my admissions to a good university? So no, because uh, if you have done relevant uh, extracurricular activities, uh, you're, you're good to go. And unless and until being very honest today, unless and until you've played a, a sport at an international or represented your country somewhere, it does not matter. Because imagine, five, again, 500 schools all across India, probably like 1,000 schools, 
uh, like 1500 schools, 2000 schools all across uh, Southeast Asian corridor, 2000 football captains applying to a university. Where do you stand? Probably nowhere. So it, it, it all matters as to what kind of a level have you played that uh, sport at. Next, we have a question from Apurv. Uh, Apurv, you can go for it. Okay, I think he's, he's not here. Um, uh, we have a question from Dia. Uh, what key points to keep in mind to get into IV, uh, especially for masters? So again, that's a master related question. And unfortunately, this is an undergraduate uh, session. Uh, someone is asking for SAT reading tips because uh, she can barely finish the uh, section on time. Uh, Vaspi, would you want to take this question? So I did not take the SAT, so I don't think I would be the best person to answer this. I took the ACT. Right. Uh, Arana, would you want to answer this again? Or Ritwik, anyone? Yeah. Uh, so the, it's for reading, right? The reading section. Yeah. So reading. for writing, uh, yeah. So for writing, as I said, Erika Melzer is the only thing you need. But for reading, uh, the way I did it was, uh, un or like most people do it is, just came through the passage very quickly. Just look out for numbers and like data points. And usually the first three, four questions are just directly answered from those areas. So you can easily answer those. As for the last two, three questions, which are a bit more broad, now you can go back to the passage. You kind of know uh, where exactly what part is. So just read out that part and try to answer the question. So just like uh, read quickly at once, just flash read and then go in for a deeper look for the last few questions at the end. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. Uh, do we need to stick to extracurricular activities related to a particular major or uh, can we do other activities as well? Uh, Ritwik, would you want to take this question? Oh, my short answer is no. Uh, so just using myself as an example. I, I knew I wanted to do engineering, but in high school, I also did a lot of uh, service related extracurriculars. And uh, I was also part of the model United Nations team, which is similar to debate. Um, and again, that goes back to what I was saying about a holistic, cohesive application. So what I did was I said my engineering clubs were to demonstrate my passion in engineering. My model UN extracurricular, which has nothing to do with engineering, was so that I could get the social speaking skills that are very important in any walk of life, any interest. Uh, and then I said the service related work was because I also want to do service in, in college and Princeton likes that too. Uh, right. Thank you so much. I hope that answers your question, uh, Avan. Next, we have a, a question from uh, Janobi who's asking, where do I find my research projects? Uh, I think this was already discussed and uh, uh, um, I pretty uh, nicely put it that you can go to LinkedIn to find these research projects. Also, if you get in touch with someone from Unilai, they are in touch with a lot of other agencies who connect you with P, uh, PhDs and uh, with master's students uh, who are doing some research at the university level. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Stephen again, who's saying, can I please ask a question? Hi. Uh, so the next question that I'm going to ask is about community service. So uh, before choosing psychology and music as a nine candidate major, I was thinking about uh, pursuing pre-medicine in uh, neuropsychiatry. So I have done relevant uh, things in the field of community service, working with UNESCO and World Vision throughout India. And I have my own NGO. I just set up for mental health society that I would be converting to psychology and uh, music therapy. So uh, adding that into my profile and giving the uh, background details, why did I create that in the first place? Would that affect my application in a positive way or would they be thinking that this guy is just moving from medicine to psychology? Who would want to take that question? Uh, and if I think mm -hmm. it would definitely help you a lot because you're connecting like two different fields, two, three different fields into social impact. And colleges like Yale specifically really care about how you give back to the community because in general, like that shows how you would interact with other people in, in college. Uh, so it need not be that you have to do a huge drive or like donate stuff. It can be as simple as like uh, music therapy, which you mentioned. But I think it really depends on how you present it, not only in your EC list, but in your essays. Because most colleges have a question about your favorite extracurricular in high school. And I think this one 
that you just described would be a perfect fit for that. And I think Unit Ally could really help structure those kind of essays and make it much more personal and much more unique because how you present it really matters. It doesn't matter what you did, but how the AO reads it and feels about it. Okay. I have just one small question. Can I go with that? Uh, yeah, just go for it. Okay. So uh, I'm working in the uh, in the aspect of mental health. So I have recently worked with Sasha Agarwal uh, with Harvard Spark program as an uh, associate joining 2000 schools. So I have done that also and I have uh, been uh, like trying to open my production now that would be solely making every uh, content surrounded with music and psychology. So I was also thinking to add that into my profile. So it's just a suggestion. So, so now again, that is a very specific question. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot answer this because as we said, it totally depends. So it will be best that you get connected to an advisor. And again, it's free of cost to get connected to an advisor. So I recommend you do that. Um, next, we have Prisha who is asking again from Illinois. Uh, could you please repeat the 28 students selected thing? Uh, I think you mentioned something uh, that a university selects uh, a no. number of students. I think she she means the Ashoka Young Change Makers. Right. Is that it? Right. I'll send the link anyway. Okay, so 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 you'll be sending the link on chat, so you guys can just copy it. Uh, Stuti uh, could not ask a question earlier. Could you please ask? You can definitely go ahead and ask it now. Okay, I think I think she's not here. Uh, so I, I'm going to close the panel now because I can see that a lot of questions are specific to students. Uh, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Okay, Harshita has a question. Harshita, you can quickly go for it. Uh, yeah, I actually wanted to ask that I have, I'm in my senior year, but I haven't done any kind of internships. Rather than my summer programs, I have done due training to the high school students. Would that be helpful if I put it in my application? Uh, so yes, uh, and no, it depends on how well you put it. Uh, uh, you know, because uh, uh, it does not matter even if it's a very small activity, uh, as long as you, you've mentioned it well, like, you know, and, and use active voice, don't use passive voice. So every activity that you've done uh, matters, essentially, as long as it's something related to your major or public community service, which a lot of universities uh, look big into. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Ashita. Uh, yeah, I actually did it for an uh, NGO I'm a part of, and it's particular to my major also. I'm applying for mathematics, and I tutored for mathematics for two years in summer. So so, so, so that's awesome. Uh, so I think you're, you're good to go, and definitely... Uh, do connect with someone uh, from my advising team because they can help you out better with your specific questions. Uh, next, we have Prakriti. And then we have one last question from uh, Amira. So just, just go for it, Prakriti. Yeah, so actually I wanted to ask about community colleges. Like it's a very unconventional path, uh, but still like, uh, is it valid like a community college associate degree and then transferring to a university like could you please explain like how uh, oh, that's a very good question yeah. a lot of people actually go to community colleges yeah. and then uh, yeah. you could transfer to a major university i would not suggest you choosing that part e even though it's a cheaper path for a lot of students you're an international student uh, and the us so there's something called the us uh, line of border and control that actually limits and permits a number of internationals from a particular country coming to the us now you can imagine if there are 5,000 seats, would they accept a student who's going to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, University of California, Berkeley, Davis, or would they accept someone who's going to a community college? I think that answers your question, right, Prakriti? Okay, but like uh, there's there's an Orange Coast College in uh, California, and it uh, it says that like 90% of the students get a transfer to UCLA or CSU. So like are, are uh, they the are getting. Yeah, Other numbers, ninety percent for domestic students because it totally differs from international students. International students, okay. UCs have a quota to accept state university and community student, uh, college students uh, within, from within California because UCs is majorly funded by the Californian government and so far yeah. as to most universities. So they do have to accept domestic students, but as an international, you don't have enough power. Yes, there have been some cases we get accepted, but that's again one in probably a thousand. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Uh, I think I'll have to close the panel now. Uh, so thank you so much for being a, a part of it. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. If, in case some questions are unanswered, please connect uh, with our team on uh, www.unitly.com. And uh, thank you so much.